Well, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Afternoon in the USA, evening over in Europe and beyond, and very early morning in Asia. So thank you for helping us uh, continue this good stuff, the MSP Tech Talk. Um, for those of you that are new, this is an academic format that uh, typically can run as long as 90 minutes, providing real content and graciously underwritten by well-trained and well-behaved uh, community sponsors. Today is Fortinet. We'll talk about them at midpoint a little bit. A um, little bit of housekeeping. Be sure to use the questions feature on your control panel to ask questions. I'll be monitoring those and, and, and reading the questions to our guest, who we'll introduce in just a moment. And uh, upcoming shows. Um, so we have uh, CompTIA Channel Con in early August in Las Vegas. Um, not super excited about Las Vegas, but that is a good show. That's a show that brings everybody together once a year in one place. Then we have uh, Solar Winds Empower uh, right on top of Channel Pro right after Labor Day. Jenny's going to cover off on Channel Pro down in San Jose, and I'm going to take Solar Winds Empower in Atlanta, Georgia. So with that said, next slide, please. I have a big audience today. We're talking about that. We saw it on the title slide, Azure and Small Business. They said it couldn't be done, and here's some busy people that were doing it while everyone was saying it couldn't be done. So let's go around the horn. Uh, Zach and uh, Christian, introduce yourself and, and your company, please. And then an old friend, Michael Frazier, will follow up. Sure, thanks, Harry. Uh, my name is Zach Massell. This is my business partner, Christian Nancy. We have a, a small MSP in uh, Santa Rosa, California. We're about 50 miles north of San Francisco. Um, been in business, we've been in business together for about three and a half years. Wooden Spoon's been in business for 16 and a half years. Um, we've got, uh, we're a small shop. There's the two of us. We got two other guys working with us and, uh, we're kicking butt. We'll talk more about that. All right. I'm Michael Frazier. Congratulations on completing your master's degree in computer science at Seattle university. You, you had your graduation ceremony on uh, father's day. So you and I got a good chuckle out of being both a grad and a dad, a well-known advertising theme. So mm -hmm. again, uh, and, and in all seriousness, what you're a month and a, a month out, are you catching your breath after grad school? No, I'm trying to. <clears throat> Sometimes I'm uh, wondering what to do at uh, night when I'm not going to school, but yeah. <laughs> but don't worry, I have plenty of other stuff to fill my time with. Properly introduce yourself, sir, and uh, then your company. Michael Frazier with uh, Refactor, um, been working with uh, Zach and Christian for, well, I've been working with Zach for many, many years now. I think it's over 10, maybe 11, 12 years at this point. Um, and been working with them on this uh, particular project we're going to work through for the last couple of years around uh, Azure and uh, automation. And uh, we're going to go through some really cool stuff that they've been working on. Cool. And what what does Refractor do for people that aren't, aren't familiar with you? So uh, we're a uh, computer, or a uh, computer, we're a cloud software company that provides a platform to allow uh, IT shops to be able to uh, build solutions and secure solutions in the public cloud uh, for Azure and then other clouds as well, GCP and, and uh, AWS. All right, and before I hand over uh, control as it were, uh, shout out to Lars Anderson in New Canaan, Connecticut. Lars, thank you for the photo of you, of me watching you, watching me, watching you. Lars, uh, an MSP, took a photo of the screen of what we're doing right here. So uh, thanks, Lars. Zach uh, and Michael, take it away, and I'm going to interrupt you. Outstanding. Counting on it. <laughs> uh, Mike, you want to go to the next slide? Are you going to tell everybody what a wooden spoon is? Uh, well, I, I'll give you the short version. The short version of Wooden Spoon, usually people say, you know, shortly after they meet us, and I, and I judge people by this, uh, you know, how long it takes them to say, why Wooden Spoon? And the, the short answer is because the women are smarter. Uh, I got outfoxed by my wife in the naming of the company. Um, we named it Wooden Spoon. She's like, no, you can rename it at any time. And so, uh, you know, a couple months down the road when it became time to, you know, 
uh, incorporate or whatever it was that we did back in 2003, uh, it was like, hey, well, let, let, we can change the name of the company. And there was no way by that point the name had stuck. And so she'd outfox me like she does all the time. Um, so <laughs> good job. Good job, honey. There you go. Uh, all righty. So if you, want, if you want the longer story, that's going to cost, that's definitely going to cost a beer or two for sure. It's a good story. It's a good story. And if you're wondering before I go to the next slide, the uh, the last vowel and refactor has been refactored out. So just if you were <laughs> now wondering. Inquiring <laughs> minds want to know. All right. So I'm going to take this take this first part um, and talk a little bit about how we how we got to where we are. And um, basically, what had happened was. You know we're 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 an MSP, and so we're looking we're definitely looking for clients who fit a certain size, fit a certain technology profile. And one of the things that was always kind of bothering me a little bit was we can't we kept on coming across these deals where clients, you know, well let me, let me go back a little bit and just say our typical profile is we want a client to have an on, on an on-prem server, we want them to have Active Directory. And really, it could be either, you know, it could be everything on-prem, it could be everything in the cloud, but the, the opportunities that we were saying no to, or that I found that we were saying no to quite a bit, were these companies that um, they didn't have an on-prem server. And we really didn't have uh, a good way, a solid way of providing Active Directory to them so that they would really fit into our mold. And, um, you know, the question was always, okay, great. So they're about, maybe they're about the right size. They might be a five to 10 user size client. And I have to say that most of our clients, our target market really is in that 15 to 40 range. But if I have a smaller client and they're willing to go with our plan and do things our way, I really don't want to say no. And so it's a lot easier if they have, they already have a server on-prem and they're used to dealing with everything that that entails. But if they don't, coming to them with a story of, well, you're going to need to buy a server after they've been, in their mind, doing everything they need to do uh, without a server for some period of time can be a tough sell. So, you know, I'm, I'm assuming, and, and let me go back again, I'm assuming that most of the audience, Harry, is companies like ours, relatively small companies. There may be some, some larger ones out there. Yeah. But smaller companies. That, that don't necessarily have a huge R&D budget to go and say, oh, we're going to go dedicate a bunch of staff for whatever period of time to come up with these solutions. You know, they're, they're small companies. We're, we're busy. We don't have a lot of time. You know, we're spending most of our time, you know, dealing with customer issues, chasing deals, onboarding clients, which, you know, creates even more business. And we're trying to be as efficient as we can. So, so getting the right client in the, in the door and, and on some level, expanding the target market, because we all know what happened in 2008. We certainly took a little bit of a hit in 2008. And the idea of having a, a diversified client base for us has always seemed like a necessity. So the, the, while the genesis of this was due to these smaller clients, the idea was if we can do this for smaller clients, we might actually be able to bring this to bear for larger clients as well. And um, so, you know, what were the requirements? What, 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 did, what did we want? We wanted real host, we wanted real active directory. You know, um, we didn't really want, there's, there's SaaS based products out there. Um, oh, I'm gonna go ahead and name names if that's okay. You know, there are products like JumpCloud, which yeah. are great, but they do, but they're, they're LDAP, they're not, they're not full AD. And so we didn't really want that. And even more recently, when Microsoft came out with Microsoft 365, that's also not full AD. It's it's partially AD. It's a piece of AD, but it's really not the full thing. And we really wanted to be able to implement AD and group policies to our heart's desire uh, with our client base. And so the question for us was, all right, there's clearly got to be a way to do this. And this is this is in, in fairness, you know, in the in the promo for this, Harry you wrote that uh, you know it's taken taken two years to get it to go. I want to be very clear. It's taken two years because we've been busy and we haven't been able to apply our, our yeah. uh, time to doing this. 
And I think that that's a typical thing, right? Yeah, yeah Michael absolutely. And I, yeah, right? So Michael and I have been discussing this, and, and to Michael's credit, he's been like, I'm ready to help you out. I'm ready to help you out. I'm ready to help you out. And it's like, we're trying to figure out a time when we can actually dedicate resource, uh, mostly in the form of Christian's time, um, to, Which to is this. Very valuable. It's extremely valuable. Uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the process. I'm, I'm typically, you know, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, the mostly the deal chaser. Um, you know, I, my background's in technology, but I'm trying to get farther and farther away. Christian's, Christian's really the CTO of the company, and he's really driving the technology piece. So the question is, how do we do it? Can we automate it? And if so, what can we automate? So that's the, that's where we came from. Yep, it sounds, you know, like a natural act, kind of uh, organic growth. Well, strategy too, both strategic and organic, but organic in the sense of uh, you're a small business serving small businesses and you have the same time management challenges and you fit it in when you could. So Absolutely. Everyone Absolutely. on this call, yeah, everyone on this call can relate to that. Hey, uh, while I've interrupted you, folks, uh, actually, I'll hold off to midpoint. Um, okay, please continue. My bad. Okay, slide master. Next slide, please. Boom. All right. So here's here's the use case for the most part. Um, the these the, the the clients that that we wanted to try this out on first were were the simple ones. Relatively small clients, single site, no on-premise server. They've got users who are both on site and they have mobile users. Even if it's one or two, still got to be able to deal with them. The idea was to have domain controller in the cloud and be able to sync Active Directory. You know, for, if, as long as we're going to do this, um, uh, to really make use of the full Microsoft ecosystem. So the idea would be put it, put the put the put the domain controller in Azure, and then use Microsoft's other tools to be able to take advantage of, you know, use like Azure Active uh, Azure AD Connect to be able to link AD into O365. Now, full disclosure, in for the longest time we have resisted uh, Microsoft's, you know, really adopting Microsoft's full e ecosystem. We've used Hosted exchange providers, not O365. Um, there are a bunch of them out there, I'm sure people are aware of, um, and have tried to, some of them have directory integration, some work really well, some work not so well. But what we found was that the more we resisted, the more we found that we had to do our own integrations. And so that became that became kind of frustrating seeing what kind of integration is available if you do adopt the full Microsoft ecosystem. So it's like, all right, let's see what's possible if we if we just say, fine, let's do the whole thing. Let's do let's go into Azure. Let's use O365 for for Exchange and and the the other components, SharePoint, and OneDrive, and see how this goes. So we, uh, for the first client that we integrated, they were actually, their email was already on O365, which was great. Second client that we did, their email, we had them hosted at a, at a competing exchange host. And so not only did we have to deal with, um, and, and they didn't have AD at all. So not only do we have to deal with AD implementation, we've also got to deal with O365 migration uh, uh, from, competing hosted exchange into O365. And we'll talk about that as we get a little bit further. We have some, uh, toward the end, we've got some gotchas about some of the things that we learned as we started tackling this. Hey, Zach, I have a question from Jim Tingley. Jim asked, uh, maybe I missed this, but what is the main benefit of having AD in the cloud? If you want to hit that one head on. Sure, so for us, the, it was it was a question of for clients who don't have a server in house at all and don't currently have AD. How do we? What's the what's the best way or what what are the possible ways of 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 implementing AD for them? Clearly, one is putting in an on-prem server. 
if you put in an on-prem server, then you're also dealing with all the issues that, that come along with that. Backup, having a place to put it, dealing with power, um, networking and such. So that's one opportunity. But the, the thought was, wow, if we put this in Azure, this may or, and, and, and really at the time, we hadn't even, hadn't even gotten married to Azure yet. The thought was if we put it in the cloud, there's a potential that the client can really save some money by not having, you know, not having to do the CapEx piece and just deal with from an OpEx perspective and not have to deal with any kind of the, the any space issues, any power issues, which some of these for some of these smaller clients, that's a thing. So it was not, let, let me be clear, the original genesis of the idea wasn't, hey, they already have a, have AD, let's get rid of their on-prem server and put it in the cloud. This was, they don't even have AD at all. And, and I'm trying to bring them into my target market. And so is there a way to do that that makes both technical and financial sense? All right, thank you. And thank you, Jim, for asking that question. Please continue. All right, next slide. So again, uh, the thought was not only do we wanna do this, but given our size, we want to be able to, as we look forward in everything that we're doing, all the messaging that we're getting through, you know, conferences that we go through, go to through the channel, through our peers, it's automate, 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 automate. And it's like, okay, well, that's great. That's a really, that's a wonderful message. But as a small company, how do we actually do that? What's, what's possible? Now, I'm fortunate. I'm very fortunate that Michael and I have known each other for a long time. And I know that he's big into automation. So I had, at least I had some direction to go. But the, the question still was, all right, how do we do this? I think I already, I already answered the question, why did we pick Azure? It really was to avail ourselves of everything that was uh, possible in the Microsoft ecosystem. Um, but then we still, had this, I, we still had to figure out, all right, what do we really need? Right? Is it just an AD server? Um, what kind of connectivity do we need? How is that going to work? Will that play well with our client's existing infrastructure? Or do we need to renew, do we need to do any kind of upgrades to their network infrastructure to make this work? Um, how, and, and how do we automate that? Um, can we automate the setup of Active Directory? How does that work? And then looking forward, it's like, okay, we, we kind of have an idea of what are the bits and pieces but is there a way to come up with kind of a more robust way of automating the entire solution and doing that in a way where we're not having to write that ourselves? So um, I am pretty sure this is the point at which we go to Michael and have him talk a little bit about, all right, how do you automate this stuff? What's it look like? Yeah, absolutely, thanks. Thanks, Zach. And I think a couple of main points, especially going to any public cloud like Azure, is the fact that every public cloud was created first for application developers. And so everything you do in the public cloud can be done programmatically from code. And so now looking at, you know, we've, we've been doing in the MSP world, been doing automation with RMM, but RMM is completely host based um, and maybe a little bit of network devices. But overall, um, it wasn't built for the um, public cloud to be able to do things programmatically. So we had to look at it from a step up from there. Um, and from a wooden spoon perspective, they're looking at, let's, let's try to figure out what we need from a networking perspective. What do we need from a backup perspective? You're still gonna have the same type of requirements that you would have on premise. The difference is it's going to be done programmatically and the other issue is all of the other tools that are out there require somebody like um, Christian or myself that would go in and have to actually build stuff from uh, from a configuration um, so you have to know the the intricacies of how code is and computer science fundamentals so from that standpoint what we're doing from a solution uh, or what wooden spoon is doing from a solution here is they still have to be able to deploy the infrastructure's code. They still have to be able to automate um, on a host. And so how do we go about doing that in a solution play um, versus having to do each one of these pieces in isolation? Because you could just go into the portal 
and deploy everything, right? But the problem is, how is that programmatic other than I built some documentation out and I have a, an engineer or a technician have to walk through a checklist. And as soon as it deviates from the checklist, well, I don't know what to do. And so now I have to figure this out. So um, from a standpoint, what is what I call blueprinting, um, but we start with the first piece of that, which I alluded to, which is infrastructure as code. Um, and so what is infrastructure as code? Um, it's, it's pretty much in the name, but it's, it's all of your infrastructure provided in configuration um, that declares what it is. So for instance, if I want to have uh, my network, I tell it exactly what, what the type of network I need. Um, if I want a certain type of VM, what type of VM size, so on and so forth. But I can essentially describe the infrastructure that I need. Um, and Azure uses a thing called Azure Resource Manager Templates. And these templates are um, JSON, uh, which is a, um, something they build out in um, to be able to, it's a universal um, uh, type of way to be able to uh, share data between systems. And so you can do that um, from an ARM template, but unfortunately with an ARM template, it still requires you to understand that it's code um, of sorts and that you can then build things programmatically and standardize on them. Um, and so from a standpoint of utilization, ARM templates are great if you want to be able to um, build up a bunch of different Azure services all together, um, and then be able to also repeat it over and over again and know exactly what you're doing. Because when you're in the portal, I mean, anybody who's ever been in the Azure portal, there's so many different services, there's so many different blades that are in there that you can go through and go, oh, you know what, there's 10 more services now. Oh, maybe I'll look at this. Oh, they just changed the UI for the 15th time. Um, yeah. You know, so it's, you know, ARM templates help to provide a repeatable, standardized way to get the end result that you would from the portal side but doing it um, programmatically so on the screen here we're showing and we'll come to this in a bit um, but there are so the arm template itself here is uh, in yaml but when you actually uh, deploy it's in uh, again what's called json and that is a code code representation or it's actually code of the infrastructure that you would be deploying and this is an example of a virtual machine and we'll we'll go through some more uh, in detail what that looks like in a bit. Right. Mike, and then the next piece of, oh, go ahead. Hey, Mike, I, I like to, I, he, when you and I were talking about this uh, prior, the, the point that I like to make about this is that, that the, uh, when you talk about infrastructure as code, think about that as um, setting, literally it's setting up the infrastructure piece, the network and the serve, the hosted server and, and the backup in Azure, it's not actually configuring what's going on inside the server yet, which you'll which you'll get to. This is quite being the recipe. Yeah, yeah and it's uh, I didn't even mention it, but it's it's what I what I call IT as code. This is just the first step yet. So to your point, Zach, it's the it's the first step. You have to provision. So it would be like if I were putting a a, a switch in a uh, you know a switch in a firewall and a server uh, on premise, but I haven't even touched the server yet and we just got it up and running and it's powered on and it's functional and I can get access to it. <clears throat> and the next, the next step to that is configuration management. So um, again, it's, it's code um, being able to provide the, the configuration from a code perspective and then maintain that over time. So when I'm going to, so I'm, I have a configuration that I want specifically on say this virtual machine, that's going to install AD, set up some server roles, um, you know, do some stuff. I, I need to know exactly what it's doing at that point in time. And then I also need to be able to actually change it if I want to make changes within reason, um, you know, that that can be changed in the future. Um, and so the other piece of this is the configuration on the host, which we're using Ansible. Uh, and Ansible is a uh, IT automation tool specifically for configuration management for hosts and, and other uh, devices like networking devices, but primarily in this example, we're using it specifically for the host. And so uh, we're able to build a an Ansible playbook, which again is like the infrastructure's code where there's a, you're declaring exactly what you want for your configuration, but you actually don't have to know how to code. You just have to know how a YAML file is formatted and exactly what you're passing in. Um, but from a standpoint of configuration management, uh, uh, Ansible is, is 
hearing some feedback. I'll go on mute. I have a question okay. when you get to a break point, but I'll go on mute. And uh, okay. Zach, if you could do the same to avoid the AM radio effect. All right, thanks. Um, so why why use why use Ansible? Uh, and so Ansible is the easiest tool out there from a standpoint of configuration management, but it still requires it still requires to have some kind of understanding about what's the playbook, how is it configured. Um, you actually have to have what's called a control machine to run it on. Um, but in order to be able to get the end result of what you're looking at from a configuration standpoint, it definitely makes it easier than um, trying to leverage uh, some of the RMMs out there that are limited in what they can do. And then also um, it gives you the ability to be more flexible. So you can, you can use Ansible for all kinds of other things too. Like um, you could technically use it for infrastructure as code with ARM templates. Uh, we won't get into that here. Um, but it's a very, very flexible uh, IT automation platform that's being used in conjunction with the ARM templates uh, that allow for the configuration. So it's, again, it's all going back towards we're building a solution here uh, or delivering a solution here um, and everything is taken in an agile approach. So when you build this out, you can add to it or make changes to it. It's not all set in stone, um, obviously with the caveat of, you know, you're not gonna just be able to uh, rename your domain on the fly and various things that you couldn't do if you weren't building something like this, um, uh, this type of solution. Question for Zach. Uh, Zach, we have Chris Smith. And Chris, I just looked you up on LinkedIn. You're a longtime uh, listener, first time caller out of uh, the Tech Doctors of Chicago. Thank you for, for being with us. Chris Smith asks, uh, how many techs do you have? And have you looked at something like Nerdio to mask a lot of this? Um, I have not looked at Nerdio. Uh, we have we have two techs, so it's there are four of us in the company. Okay. All right. Thank you. Please continue. I, I know Nerdio. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So. All right. So I think that's our stopping point here for Fortinet. All righty. So, folks, we are uh, graciously supported by Fortinet. Again, if you're new to our format, uh, this is the MSP Tech Talk series. We treat it as an academic quarter. Our goal is to bring real content that, that you can count on that. But in order to keep the doors open and keep us on the air, like National Public Radio and Public TV, we do uh, enjoy sponsor support. And with Fortinet, uh, they've been on board for a couple of years. They were a little bit new to our space and we've helped them integrate into our space. And Jenny in the control room is gonna show a little video we did, uh, computer uh, speakers needed. Jenny, go for it. Thank you, Jenny. And Michael, we picked that one especially for you. I actually want to have a couple minutes of talking about veterans and technology. But uh, before we do that, that was filmed. Uh, Jennifer Hallmark covered DatoCon down in San Diego. So that was down at DatoCon about a month ago. Um, Michael, so so tell us uh, about your background as a vet. We're going to take a few minutes here to honor Fortinet and what they're doing with vets. But your background as a vet and then what you're doing today with veterans and technology go. Yeah, no, thanks. I was, I was just thinking that as you were playing the video. Um, <laughs> we we're uh, thinking about you, brother. <laughs> yeah, th thanks, Harry. Um, I, I uh, ex Air Force. I worked on F-15 uh, aircraft armament systems, uh, essentially weapon systems, missiles. Uh, so I got to go, do cool things on uh, uh, fighter aircraft, uh, but from afar. And then I also was a cybersecurity engineer 
uh, in the Air National Guard. Um, so I, I got to set up things and do things that I can't tell you or I'd have to kill you. And uh, <laughs> uh, I try to say that with a straight face, but uh, um, and uh, currently, yeah, it's actually pretty awesome because uh, there's a lot of veterans programs out here now. Uh, I went through uh, Patriot Boot Camp by uh, Techstars and USAA uh, earlier this year, which was a phenomenal three-day boot camp for uh, veteran entrepreneurs and founders. Um, and then there's also a WeWork uh, and Bunker Labs uh, hmm. veteran and residence program that I'm a part of that we actually get uh, WeWork space and uh, with 10 other veterans um, that get selected in various cities around uh, the United States. And uh, Bunker Labs is awesome, uh, and they've been uh, really good about um, putting together events and stuff for, for, for other veteran entrepreneurs, um, which is nice because you've known me for a long time, Harry. And I'll tell you, 10 years ago when I, had, uh, when I, was, when I was doing another venture, actually, where I met um, Zach, I think it was a little over 10 years ago, um, yeah. there was nothing for veterans out there, nothing for us at all. And so it's, it's, it's awesome to see that, um, there's a lot of stuff coming out and also to see that, you know, stuff like Fortinet and various other companies out there that are putting together actual programs to help transitioning, uh, military members. Cause I, I really truly, uh, believe that, uh, you know, every, every military member, uh, definitely deserves a, a shot to get into uh, corporate America and leverage the skills they have or be retrained in, with new skills out there, especially in cybersecurity. Uh, it's funny, I think that stat, I had that same exact stat on my uh, presentation at uh, IT Nation when I won Pitch It, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And a tip of the hat to Fortinet. Folks, give Fortinet a fresh look. And then in the chat session, uh, since we are at, at, not quite midpoint, but a good point, um, in the chat window, you will see uh, a contest we're currently running between now and Labor Day to be a 365 hero. And a hero is someone that, do you work with Windows? Do you work with 365? Are you interested in security and or mobility? If you can answer yes as an MSP partner to any of those above, nominate yourself with that link and we have uh everyone on this call will like we one of our criteria is we have a question about how are you involved in your community michael in your case you're uh inter interfacing with veterans organizations you're a vet yourself so um please 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 if you could click over nominate yourself or someone else if you meet the criteria of any 365 or windows experiences in msp michael back to you Thanks, Harry. All right, so we brought up uh, IT as code and, and having to do things programmatically. And, and, and frankly, and this goes right to that, somebody asked about uh, Nerdio and why solutions out there exist um, to be able to build. Um, so for about the last few years, I've been building uh, what's called CSAP, working closely with uh, Wooden Spoon and various other partners. Um, and CSAP is, the Cloud Plus Security Architect platform. And it's really about being able to blueprint your reference architectures and deploy them for customers. And so with Wooden Spoon, the this particular uh, scenario and various others, but this one, this particular scenario to build this out um, has been iterative. I think we've added two or three different things to what the current state of it is now. Uh, one of them being uh, uh, the, the site to site VPN. Um, and there's some various other things we'll be adding in as well. Um, the code component is only, or the code is only in components. So in order to build things with different tools and do it programmatically, they still have to be code. So something like, again, somebody brought a Nerdio, that stuff still happens from an API or a, a templating perspective. It's just hidden behind the scenes. And the one thing that we're trying to do is allow people to have more flexibility in what they want to be able to deploy and add in. Um, and so, you know, if you're, if you have somebody like, you know, Christian at Wooden Spoon who can get in and do some more complicated things or, um, or even if you don't, but you want to start using some of the, the, um, the components that are already pre-built out, you can get right away at building solutions visually. So there's a visual designer. Um, so again, the code is in the components, but once they're an actual component, they can be used visually inside of the blueprint designer. And this is all goes down to agile uh, solution delivery um, to be able to tie in various services, cloud services 
and different products that you may be uh, already utilizing uh, on customers uh, on-premise now, or maybe not, and there's some things you want to add in. Um, and so if you really just think about all this, it's about, it's all, everything is software defined, or as I like to call it, IT as code. And you want to be able to iterate on this over time too, because this is just a starting point. This is not a stopping point, uh, written in stone type of um, approach. This is a, let's build this and then add or subtract to it over time as required in the software that we call that ad, an agile approach. Um, but in, in, and we're using that same term here for solution delivery. All right, Zach, I'll let you take it, take this one. I think you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> I could hear myself just fine. I don't know what your problem is. Uh, right. So um, you're saying that that you're taking this taking this iterative approach. Um, there are things that are not automated yet in our implementation. Um, the actual uh, configuration of on-prem firewall, the site-to-site -site VPN between the on-prem firewall and Azure is not, not automated at this point. Um, uh, setting up uh, the users, groups, and GPOs, um, that could be automated in a variety of different ways. We haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, uh, one of the things that comes up when you're doing, you know, hosted AD uh, for uh, an, an on-prem users is there are situations where you might need to designate um, a, a machine uh, as a print server, potentially, potentially as a file server, depending on how you're sharing files, um, or for other users for for, for certain apps, uh, database apps that um, may need to share the database, like for us super common one is QuickBooks. So um, if you don't have an on-prem server and you've got a designated machine, maybe it's a user's machine, maybe it's a standalone box that you use for these functions. And so we haven't, we haven't quite gotten there yet. Harry, you that, look like you're on Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm unmuting myself because we use QuickBooks and that is, we're certainly not alone, but that's one of the more frustrating um, applications in my portfolio i mean we got the we we got the c drive concept we got the citrix receiver concept we uh i'm gonna go back on mute because i don't don't get me going <laughs> well, you, know, the, the, you know clearly you know i, I don't i don't want to i don't want to knock uh knock into it too much because the i own i own another business with my wife who's a professional bookkeeper and she's, you know, she's a QuickBooks Pro advisor. So fortunately, we have, you know, she she can help us with the, on the bookkeeping side from the QuickBooks and setup stuff. That's really that's really what we do. And you know, one of the questions that clients, you know, we get frequently from clients is, does it make sense for us to go to QuickBooks online? And if you have a question about that, seek out your local QuickBooks Pro advisor. Um, that's certainly not not one that we'll uh, <laughs> do for you. Uh, but that is that is what some people are doing. If that works for them, great. But there are a lot of companies for whom it doesn't make sense for them to go to QuickBooks online. There's functionality there that doesn't exist or is not as good yet uh, as on the, the desktop version. Um, so um, joining the local, other things that we haven't quite automated yet, um, joining the, the on-prem PCs to the, to the, to the domain. Um, we do use a program called ProfWiz, which is great, which allows you to join a domain and preserve the user profile at the same time. So you can take a, take a PC from work group mode into a domain join PC and preserve the user profile. It's a beautiful thing. So it's critical in this. Yeah, it absolutely is critical. And and even even with smaller clients, you know, the last thing that they're they're gonna want to do is have to completely reconfigure their Windows desktop because you had this harebrained idea to put their AD in the cloud. Um, and and so you know these are things that we're we're gonna be working on over time uh, to to add to the automation piece, some of which, you know, Michael and I are probably it's an, it's a whole other a whole other webinar to talk about how to use or how CSAP and some of Michael's other products might be able to be brought to bear to do some of these things. Um, and some of them can be done, you know, like the, uh, the uh, AD user setup and such, that's, that's something that could probably be done right away. Anything you want to add to that, Mike? <clears throat> I mean, that, that covered most, yeah, mostly everything. I think 
the other the other piece of this is just really trying to laser focus in on what is the most valuable from your you know company to be able to realize some automation out of the gate um, that you're not able to do with um, RMM currently. And so I think that you know so some of this could be done with RMM. Obviously, some of it you know, just depends on you know the process you're going to do. But I think at the end of the day, it's really about a a, a, mold, a mindset and, and a culture shift in how you guys are thinking about things. And I, I've seen even over the last couple of years, you know, you guys have really, um, you know, pushed pretty hard on trying to figure out what makes the most sense for you, you and, and willing to actually uh, spend some time too. I'm going to say, you know, none of this is super and none of this is uh, magic. It does require some level of effort, no matter how simplified you try to make uh, a product or try to, to make it easier to use. And so I would still, you know, you still need to be cognizant about um, what you want to automate and what is not automated yet. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, hey, if you can automate 50, 60% of it and then do the next 10% and the next 10%, I mean, eventually your future state, you hope to be, you know, as close to 100% automated as possible. Um, and I think we can get there. I also think a lot of the vendors in this space are catching up to even allowing for things to be deployed programmatically. <laughs> I mean, I was talking to one vendor who you can't even deploy their product um, from uh, from the command line so to, to be able to, 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 to deploy it programmatically and so they'd have to make a complete change to their their product offering so I think you know it's also a, a mindset a culture shift and development effort that um, vendors are put having to put in too to be able to, to realize this these capabilities to automate as people are moving towards the public cloud you got to automate other things that get in the other provision in the public cloud too yeah, that, that's for sure. I mean, you bring up a really good point. You know, one of the things that we're trying to do as a, as a small company is do more with less. And and really, the way that you do that, you either, you know, you've got, you have to find efficiencies wherever you can find them. And, um, you know, the, the provisioning setup of cloud resources is clearly, I mean, that's a, that's a, that seems like low hanging fruit in a lot of, in a lot of respects. The, the, the other thing I'll add to this also is the, uh, the idea that by using more enterprise class uh, products, uh, you are more exposed to, uh, to having access to uh, programming, uh, deploying things via programmation. Uh, a small $50 router, you're not going to be able to automate that. But if you start talking about, uh, again, enterprise class uh, firewalls, uh, the tools are there uh, to allow uh, Michael to write something that's going to interface with it and uh, include that into the, the blueprint. Yeah. Yeah. One actually, and I, I didn't mention this earlier. One thing, other thing to think about too is, you know, if you have an on-premise server per se, you know, so let's take out the networking piece of it, but an on-premise AD server, what do you have that's redundant in that AD server? You may have RAID. Um, you may, you know, you may have, hopefully have. Uh, uh, backup so you could do restore, but you probably don't have a secondary server to restore there. So you're going to have to figure that piece out. And so one of the things I think is not really thought about much moving into the public cloud is going, okay, well, you know, the cloud is somebody else's, somebody else's data center, right? It's somewhere else. Um, but moving to like Azure gives you immediate redundancy of storage, of compute. I mean, you get all to, to Christian's point, enterprise level uh, capabilities around the infrastructure that you did you would you don't have on premise at all. I mean, right out of the gate, you get three copies of your data in a single data center, um, which is more than probably every single deployment of you know at least a single server deployment uh, for any uh, customer. So just thinking about that, and then if you just build on that from the networking perspective and everything else, um, you're you're getting an enterprise level uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, with the solution that you're providing to the customer when they're in, when you moved it then to the public cloud. Hey, gents, I, I have a couple questions lined up. Uh, Dan Lapp out of Florida said, uh, many of us are still working on non-automated methods to set up cloud-only environments for clients. What are a few good resources for info? So still non-automated methods, seeking some resources for info. 
So he wants to, he wants to know how to deploy things non automated in the public cloud. Uh, for that, I, I think what he's getting at is Dan is suggesting um, he would like to do more automation. So he's using non automated methods uh, for cloud um, only uh, set up for cloud only environments for the clients. Any good resources come to mind? I mean, any LinkedIn courses that have popped out to you guys? Go. Yeah, I mean, there's some some Azure certifications that you can get. Um, you can just go through the whole list and and look at those. They're they're pretty they're pretty good at this point. They're they're pretty good certifications, and I would I would recommend looking at those. As for more general purpose information around that, I would say look at either some of the stuff that Microsoft has out there in general around any of the services that you're deploying for the customer. Um, or look at other outside tools. Um, one of the things, you know, a lot of the tools out there for automating um, into the public cloud are, are more developer focused. Um, you can look at them out there, some of the ones we mentioned. I mean, you can look at ARM templates and what they look like and what exactly they are. You can look at um, Ansible. Um, you could also look at other products out there that help automate. They have some, some content out there as well. Um, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to plug my stuff here, but if you go look like uh, just there was the uh, CRN emerging uh, cloud vendor list that just came out. I think Nerdio's in there. We're in there. I would go start looking at some of the, the products out there that are specifically around cloud automation because um, there's con some content put out there. And then just generally speaking, um, you could even get into those tools and, and check them out and see if they'll work for you. Okay. Uh, next question back with Chris Smith uh, out of the Chicago area. Chris says, I have had fits and starts due to the differences in Azure and on-prem. What advice do you have for those trying to make the transition? Um, you there? There you yeah. go. Uh, so there's, there, there are tools that would integrate uh, between on-prem and, and what Azure, what Microsoft provides as their, as their Azure solution, as far as uh, transitioning from on-prem to uh, having a solution like, like what we're describing today, uh, it's more about uh, adding more uh, domain controllers and more sites to your environment. So uh, an example is uh, someone who already has uh, and we're gonna we're gonna show that example a little later, but I'm just gonna give you a, a, a quick idea. Is uh, some someone who has already has a, a couple of servers on site? They also have satellite offices which are not connected and they don't have really they can't really justify being 80 at those sites. Um, the idea is to deploy uh, one component on the uh, in the cloud on on, on Azure, an uh, 80 uh, VM on Azure. Uh, connect that to your uh, AD environment in your domain uh, and have those replicate, just like you replicate the main controllers between different sites and from there on, all the satellite offices refer to that cloud instance. Uh, so you're hybrid that way, it's just a simple uh, one AD forest. Uh, and you can have, you can break down your forest in multiple uh, domains if you need to, depending on the size and, and requirements of the client. Uh, but even single forest, single domain, uh, you can still have multiple domain controllers, some in the cloud and some on premise. That's the way I would typically uh, approach a, a, a transition like this. All righty. I'll go, or any other comments, or I'll go back on mute. Gentlemen, let's continue. We've got about 40 minutes left. Okay. Awesome. All right. Oh, these are fun. <laughs> this could take longer than 40 minutes, I think, Zach and Chris. Right, exactly. <laughs> so um, these are just a couple couple things that we, a uh, couple potholes that we stepped into along the way that uh, if this helps you on your journey, then then ho hopefully it will. Um, do you want to? Sure. Go? Well, I, I just wanted to preface this. Uh, I realized this on, 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 on watching the presentation again as, as we go through the, the webinar. One thing that uh, uh, I want to make clear is we, we, we thought about security it was one of our one of our uh, one of our big thing for, for us was okay it's great you put stuff on the cloud uh, how do you make sure that you still preserve 
you know, security people would expect when they have equipment on premise. Uh, and the way we've done this is um, uh, part of the part of the, the template to deploy with a uh, uh, with CSAP is uh, having a VPN point-to-point -point VPN tunnel between the Azure instance and the uh, whatever however many sites the client has and at, at those uh, sites they all have their own firewall uh, with a VPN tunnel which means those instances those Azure instance are really only visible where you're inside the perimeter uh, we, we purposefully turn off uh, remote access uh, to those uh, to those uh, instances uh, you've got to be some somewhere inside the network yeah. to get to them uh, and we can control all the traffic that way. So that's that's one of the things that I wanted to make sure that I'm not sure it was clear in the deployment is uh, it does require point-to-point -point VPN and it's a good thing. Uh, I think it's, it's yeah. really uh, yeah. the best way to ensure that you control uh, the various uh, entry point into your network. Yeah. So that being said, yes, we found some, uh, uh, some, some little problems around VPN uh, at first uh there's different different vendors for hardware firewalls have different ways to implement uh uh point point vpns uh they do uh, well, especially especially specifically specifically to azure yeah specific to azure and then uh we did find uh we've listed those three here because uh, those are among the one that we've uh, we've come across is uh, uh fortinet sonicall and sophos uh they specifically have Articles uh, freely available on their on their knowledge base that will uh, get you through uh, setting up a point-to-point -point VPN between Azure and and an on-premise uh, network. Right. Uh, it's the, the the VPN side on the on the Azure side is very sensitive to uh, to the uh, to the way it's supposed to be set up. So you got to make sure that all those uh, all those uh, uh, settings line up correctly and. and we had a little bit of growing pain around that, but we, we were able to uh, go beyond that. Yeah, growing, growing, growing pain meaning getting a call from a client off hours, going, uh, you know, why isn't, why can't I get out to the internet? Um, not so much why can't I log onto my machine because our ID credentials were 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 okay, but we we discovered that uh, when the VPN went down, that they also lost DNS. Which kind of goes we're going to skip over that second bullet go to the third point which is um, if you're relying upon your hosted ad in instance for uh, dns service um, you've got to make sure you have something in place that allows for for dns failover and we're happy to go into more detail on that if people want to hear about that but we're we basically have a, a solution that allows us to use open dns from cisco um, to to enable us to do DNS failover and fail back gracefully. So even if the VPN goes down, users are still able to access resources out on the internet until that VPN comes back up. And we've also, we've also implemented monitoring and um, uh, shutdown and restart of that VPN. Of the, of the, of the VPN. Yeah, that's where, that's where the traditional, more traditional RMM tools come into play. Uh, it's more on the monitoring side and on the remediation side for, for things like this, which is what most of us probably already do uh, for on-prem services and, 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 and uh, right. um, yeah. And then the other, oh, the other, oh, go ahead. I was gonna just bring up one thing about the uh, the site to site too. Uh, one, <laughs> that's one area that um, eventually, if it can be completely automated would, uh, ensure that's not a gotcha because it's one thing you know you have engineers that know how to do this stuff they get in they figure out they tinker around and they get it working and then you get it working and and you know hopefully even document it but once once even even that you could get somebody else in at a later point in time and if they have to come in and try to configure it especially vpn those are one of the things where it's just like everything has to be set up exactly a certain way on either side um and so a great place for for um you know, be able to continue the, the automation story. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so going to the middle bullet, this was this is an issue where um, that we ran into with a client that had their exchange hosting at uh, not not in O365. We needed to do the 
0365 data migration first, or new, do the data, data migration as well as setting up um, Azure AD Connect. So for those that don't know, at what Azure AD Connect allows you to do is link your own Active Directory on-prem or hosted into O365. Well, so it turns out if you're doing a data migration, an email data migration, you've got to com like completely do that. You need to get the, the client completely over onto O365 first and, and, and uh, stop the data migration and then enable Azure AD Connect Otherwise, uh, suffice to say, bad things happen. So <laughs> don't do that. Um, if you turn on Azure AD Connect while the data migration is going, that's no good. And if you turn Azure AD, a, Azure AD Connect on before you start the migration, it will not let you do a cutover migration, period. It's grayed out. So lesson is O365 migration, do that, and then do Azure AD Connect. Get that yeah, well, so it really, really uh, allows you to bring all of that together uh, working on other, on our, integrating other um, uh, Microsoft ecosystem products into the fold there, uh, following what Microsoft is offering. Uh, but the idea is that you want one one person, one identity uh, across the board, uh, and that's really the message that Microsoft is pushing. So we're just following on those on those steps. Uh, Azure AD Connect is a great way to do this. It's very simple. It's much, much more, much, much simpler than the uh, uh, federation. It still gives you a lot of functionality that most of us, uh, our clients, would, would require. Um, so if you don't know about Azure AD Connect, I, I strongly suggest you, you read up on that. Uh, in and of itself, it's a great product. Even if you keep AD on premise for your existing clients, that's still something that, uh, that, that's very beneficial for your clients. Handy. Yes. Yep. Oh, uh, muted. Uh, Ari, I think you're muted. Yeah, yeah there he knows. <laughs> Go on. I think you can hear us. <laughs> I think he's asking Jenny to unmute him. <laughs> Maybe people can yeah. hear so us. We, so let's work. Let's. Harry's <laughs> unmuted. So, can you hear us now? He, he sees just us keep going, guys. <laughs> all right, all right. So, all right. So, no, go ahead. yeah. So, the 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 point here is, you know, we the the going back to the genesis of the idea, we were looking at at originally a pretty simple a pretty simple use case. Um, you know, one one client, one site, some remote users, and a hosted AD controller. Although the truth of the matter is, once you're once you've got AD hosted, that gives you a ton of flexibility to do different things. For example, we've got a client here that has um, the two offices that already have um, servers in them that uh, where there's VPN between the sites and Active Directory synced between those two sites. But they've got nine other sites that, for a variety of reasons, are not using AD, and they are very much interested in having AD set up at those other sites. And so they were not particularly thrilled about the idea of buying nine more servers. Um, and most of those sites are, they're, they're probably between three users and 20 users or so. And we thought that those would also be good candidates. Now, to be fair, we have not implemented this yet, but this is on our roadmap of what to do which is um, for those sites that already have uh, the, the AD server there, the domain controller there, is to, to sync that to the hosted AD controller, hosted domain controller, and then have the other sites, the other nine sites, actually authenticate when they're, when they're logging in, they authenticate against the cloud-based uh, DC. So um, again, multi-site deployment, some on-prem servers, some, ser some sites with no servers at all, Again, uh, on-site mobile users use that same hosted domain controller and, and do sync AD to O365. So while the, the on-prem piece of this is more complex, the blueprint for setting this up in the cloud is almost identical. So um, it just it, it goes to show what, what you can do when you use this approach and you have a blueprint that you can 
spin up. I mean, literally, you know, it's a couple of clicks. You have to fill in a couple of fields to, to customize it for the client, but you can have a, a, an AD server up and running in, in literally you know, an, an hour or two, maybe less. Um, so just going to show some different cases here. Yeah, Jens, can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you now. Okay, I, I, I came in on phone. I don't know what happened to the computer mic. Quickly, uh, let's play a little bit of catch up. Uh, uh, Ernst uh, Van Haringa is asking, um, yes, please review OpenDNS failover monitoring. Uh, Ernst, I made a note over here. We will do that in fall quarter. Uh, we're going to be a little bit tight on time today, so we'll do a DNS double click fall quarter. So I have made that note. Then Chris Smith. Uh, Gary, Gary, if, actually, if I may interrupt, if he would, if he would like to do that, you know, we'd be happy to to provide a couple steps if that's something that he's interested in. Okay. All right. And um, I'll, I'll connect you with Ernst uh, offline as well, and then we'll also. Look at fall quarter quickly. Chris Smith says, uh, you mentioned these three vendors. Do they all use these or do they standardize and only one? That goes back to the slide where I think you mentioned Fortinet and SonicWall. You had three vendors up. Uh, again, the question is, um, you mentioned that these three vendors, uh, do they all use these or do they standardize on one? We do. Um, we do. We do standardize one on on one uh, on uh, my apologies to our sponsor today for uh, we we are at this point we are a sonic wall shop. Um, and yeah. Okay. No, we keep it real. Yep. We keep it real. Uh, Garrett Moore asks, how do your customers react to the total cost of ownership over time with Azure? So so far so good. Um, you know. The, the the point is well taken because if you do a pay as you go account, you know we're doing we're doing a relatively small Azure instance, and if you do uh, pay as you go, it's um, yeah it's it's a yeah it's somewhere in the neighborhood of between 100 and 125 dollars a month. That same instance, if you do it reserved. Um, drops down to something like 70 something a month. So part of it is, you know, based on how the client is willing to pay for it. Um, if they want to pay for it on, the, on an annual basis rather than a monthly basis. And yep. um, up to this point, we haven't we haven't been reselling it. We've just been letting the client put the Azure instance in their name on their credit card and um, and pay for it directly. And so far, it's actually worked out well. You know the so much of this depends on the client and how you frame it, your relationship with them. Do they trust you to really implement this? And and um, the and, and their space requirements. And the clients that we've implemented this for um, were more than happy to not have us do a $10,000 or $10,000 plus uh, on-prem server installation for them. And and go over time and figure out what's gonna what's gonna be necessary. And and going back to what Michael was driving at, you know, very much so, which is very much part of this process, is just because you go this way, if the client really doesn't like it, if for whatever reason it isn't working for them, you can always go back and put in an on-prem server. And, and it's not that it's really not that big a deal. And you could probably you could almost clone it. I'm not quite clone it, but pretty close. Bring all that stuff, suck it all out of the the domain controller on the hosted in the host environment, and bring that back to an on-prem server. So the risk is, the way that we look at it, is relatively low. Uh, but we haven't had anybody say yet, "Wow, this we really hate this this environment where we haven't had to lay out a whole ton of money." Um, you know, we want to go back the other way. Plus, the the other thing I wanted to add to this is uh, from a, from a sizing standpoint, uh, typically uh, most of us are used to. Uh, uh, I mean, a client, uh, when we engage a client with a client and they, they require hardware on premise, we're thinking long term. So, uh, even though we might deploy just a, a small domain controller uh, file server for, for very few files, we're already thinking, thinking in our head this company is going to grow. They, they're going to have different needs. So, we're not going to put a itty bitty server from the get-go that needs to be replaced in two years. It just doesn't make sense. So the CapEx typically is fairly fairly sizable because we think about those things right. for the long term. 
as opposed to when you uh, look at this from a, from a Azure standpoint and a, and a VM provisioning standpoint, you really want to provision what you need because you don't need more than that. Uh, if you need to throw more resources at it, virtual environments are great for that. Yeah. You can size things up as you need to, but an, an AD server really doesn't do a whole lot much. Uh, unless you're serving 10,000 clients every morning at 9 a.m., uh, you're not going to have much uh, going on on that AD server. Uh, so you can size small and grow uh, and see how that, that, that goes with the, the, the client's uh, 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 purse, uh, see how, they, uh, how you can make that work for them. Yeah, and I think to that point right there, just, just to make a point real quick, um, yeah. the, the other thing to think about, so to your point, Christian, about sizing too, a lot of times we'll be sizing to also looking at, oh, let's virtualize a few other things on premise too, or what, are the, what does the future state look like for the customer a year down the road, two years down the road? And so with the, the public cloud, uh, specifically, or Azure, um, or any of the public clouds, really, um, being able to have another step towards trying to increase efficiencies by exactly to Christian's point, allocating exactly what the customer needs for the particular uh, workload that they're putting onto that particular service, and then being able to expand, you know, up or down, so it's super flexible, as in the cloud world called uh, the elasticity of uh, the, the services that you have, but being able to, to be flexible on uh, what what resources that you're allocating um, out there, and so being able to do that, and then adding, being also being able to add in addition to, and having literally unlimited uh, capacity for what you need for your customers. All right, hey folks, let's do a sanity break. We're just after 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Jenny has been pinging me over here to. Make mention over in the chat window, we have the 365 Heroes contest. So the top 100 heroes receive a digital copy of my book. Uh, you get a badge uh, that validates your expertise. And uh, one lucky hero will get an all-expenses-paid trip to Sherwood, uh, Sher Sherweb Cloud Accelerate up in Montreal in basically mid-October. So if you could be kind to take a look at the chat window. Got a lot of questions. Um, gentlemen on the panel, uh, we're roughly 1.10 p.m. Do you guys have the flexibility to go over a few minutes and, and I'll hold the questions till the end? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And we're almost to the end of the Yeah, still slide. Make rolling. Yeah. yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. So uh, Ben, Robert, Chris, uh, a lot of questions. Hang on, guys. Okay, go. <laughs> <laughs> no, all good. You want to touch base on what else you guys are attempting to automate, Zach? Yeah, these are, I mean, just kind of quickly, you know, the idea of, and we've mentioned some of this before, um, we want to be able to do the things that are on our roadmap are trying to automate firewall config. Um, Azure AD Connect, not quite automatable yet, and that's a Microsoft issue. Harry, whatever you can do to influence those folks at Microsoft to make that automatable, please, please, please. Um, Third-party agent installs, things like RMM or OpenDNS Umbrella, those kinds of things. Um, ticketing, ticketing into the RPSA, we're ConnectWise managed users, um, but you can use you can use CSAP to automate notifications not only when things are created but when certain events happen um, on your on your hosted server so that we get we get tickets. Um, Mike, you want to talk a little bit about security benchmarking and security benchmarking marking and remediation? Yeah, yeah. So this is this is super exciting stuff. So um, some of the stuff we're working on, on building in uh, is around the CIS, so the Center for Internet Security Benchmarks. Um, we're a member of their organization and we're working towards, there's a couple of things. One is the uh, Azure uh, Foundations, we call the Foundations Benchmark, um, and we'll have them for AWS and GCP too, but specifically for, for Azure here, um, we'll have that, uh, which will essentially go through a bunch of different security controls and uh, see if they're in place. And if they're not, uh, can actually will actually be able to remediate those. Uh, so that's that's coming and something that will be that or, you know, anybody using CSAP will be able to have access to. And then the other piece is on security benchmarking around operating systems and various hosts. Um, so again, around CIS and. We're looking also towards uh, uh, NIST and some others as well, but the CIS is what we're working with at this point. And so I think, you know, from our standpoint, it's 
you know, hey, if you have a Windows host, uh, kind of to what Christian was saying earlier, you have to be very cognizant and conscientious about your security, obviously setting up a VPN, but then even going further into in depth on that and saying, hey, look, you know what, we need to ensure that, you know, we're using hardened images or running through a checklist of what exactly we have on a uh, Windows box, uh, making sure that if there's any vulnerabilities out there or uh, controls that we haven't set to try to apply. And it's really about, you know, looking at the, the balance between um, people being able to get access to their apps and their data and ensuring that they're secure uh, from bad actors out there. And so I would, I would say there's a, there's a balance there and automation is one way though to uh, streamline that process and make it easier because nobody has time to go through a CIS benchmark and step-by-step -step look at every single last control. But if you had something that had visibility around that, and then also the remediation piece is key because, hey, uh, a lot of the security products that are out there currently, they'll give you alerts and let you know what's going on from a security perspective, but they actually don't do anything with it. And so I think having it actionable and being able to actually remediate, especially when you're building solutions and iterating on them and vulnerabilities come out and issues arise that you need to be able to change. And so you need to have something that's flexible um, in that regard. And, and just generally as well from a security standpoint, uh, being able to add in you know, any other services too. So there's a myriad of, of services on you know, Azure specifically, but all the other major public clouds. And so um, you know, there's you know, different ones like adding in key vaults or wanting to encrypt, you know, being able to automate all of those as well from a security standpoint. Because you may have some customers that have compliance requirements where they have to you know, encrypt in transit and rest or whatever it is. And so, and then that maps to a particular security control. And so being very cognizant about um, what your clients can have in place. And I think, you know, we've had conversations around this, Zach, you know, a lot of customers, um, they kind of, they look at security as, as secondary. And as a service provider, you try to do everything possible to have everything in place for them that's going to allow them to be secure. But at the end of the day, it's on the client um, to ensure that they're compliant for whatever it could be a medical customer with HIPAA or whatever. And so I would say this just makes it a much more streamlined process that if you can, you can add in other services as well, you know, or, or you know, you know, like two factor authentication or um, whatever may be that's going to help them to continue towards having controls in place to be compliant, automation is going to help with that. And so that that's kind of the the final bullet point. Um, almost anything but can be automated. You really got to think about what you want to automate. That's one of the practice. One of the exercises that we've been going through with Wooden Spoon is, you know, hey, what what makes the most sense to automate? What what are what are some day to day tasks um, that we can incorporate into these solution blueprints? Um, how can we make it easier to streamline this and and make it easier to do, uh, as Zach said, more with less? Um, that's really the key to automation in general. So that's All righty. <laughs> okay, gents, where are we at? We ready for some questions or, uh, Michael, I'd like to hold them to the end. You got a couple more to knock out and we'll do the question. One more slide. We have one more slide and this is just kind of All right. building on Azure AD and, and, and I'll actually, you want to take over Zach and Christian and kind of Explain sure. where you're kind of sure. things. Yeah, this is this is you know this is this is a little bit of a shameless in, in my mind. It was important to me to do a little bit of a shameless plug for for Michael's product. You know, while the what we're talking about today is putting AD in the cloud, and Michael's product has enabled us to do that more quickly than we would have been able to do that by ourselves. No doubt about it. And and not only that, replicate that now multiple times. Um, this is just an example of something else you can do in addition. This is a <laughs> this is a, a, a remote desktop server with its own domain controller on the same LAN, and then a remote desktop gateway in a separate LAN, uh, separate domain. Um, we use a product called Parallels for desktop yep. virtualization, but this is yep. a blueprint that this is a functioning blueprint that actually allows us when this is run when this is launched when it's done i can go to the parallels client on my machine and connect to a windows desktop through dmz through, through dmz so it just shows 
a little bit more of the power of what CSAP can do. And, and I'm telling you, this is just scratching the surface. So if you had in your mind that, that, that CSAP was just for, you know, doing these really simple little implementations, that's nothing could be further from the truth. So Mike, it's, it's a nod to, to what Michael has created and um, what he's enabled us to do with, uh, with our small staff. So thank you. Yeah, and, and Zach, what I just did is I, over here in OneNote, I just added uh, for fall quarter, let's do a part two of this topic. Um, lots of questions. Sounds like we can go deeper. I'll talk to you guys offline, but I j just FYI, I'm making a note. Um, sure. gen gentlemen, let me know when you're you're ready for, for questions. Let's do it. Let's do questions. All right. All right. Hold on, guys. Uh, have um just to, to, let me get the relevant ones a lot of compliments so okay ben uh i'll quest ben hello again he asked what exactly does your service bundle include if the clients are paying for the azure instances directly is it uh traditional msp services ben all quest yeah so we, the, the idea is and I'm going to steal. I'm going to steal from. I, I got this from Gary Pika. The idea is make it simple to explain to your clients. Make it simple to explain to your staff. Make it easy to under so that you can. You know, you've got to keep it straight in your head. Our offering to our clients is pretty much the same, whether they have their 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 resources on prem or in the cloud. It pretty much makes no difference. There are some slight implementation tweaks, but ultimately it's the same. It's full MSP. We charge per user per month. We bundle everything in. The only thing in this instance that's not included for them is they pay for the Azure separately. Um, but pretty much, and some clients want to pay for O365 separately too. Okay, fine. We factor that into their monthly per user price. But everything else, everything else is covered. And, and, and okay. one thing to add. That it, it's really from a standpoint of, of uh, um, pro, or gross revenue or gross profit, I should say, off the revenue that you would realize from Azure is not significant. And a lot of customers will go and, and get stuff themselves. So there are some distributors out there and, uh, that offer Azure services where you can make, you know, around 10 points. Um, so if you can do that, but at the same time, I would also, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with. A customer having an account as long as you can get access to it and have admin access and can administrate their account um you know shouldn't be a problem whether it's their account or um you have a, a csp account with microsoft or whatever that may be yeah. Yeah, we, we we really i think from a philosophy standpoint from a value standpoint uh we're here to offer a service and we, we we'd rather people pay us for the service we offer than just simply uh put some put some money in our pocket just uh uh, offering something that somebody else has put together. Uh, oh, I'm, not, again, I'm, I'm definitely not about doing that. <laughs> <Okay>. Well, <laughs> as a company, as a company, maybe maybe Zach is different. But as a company, our values are more on the line of uh, uh, let's provide a service that people sure. feel feel good about and that serves them, and that, that's that's where we that's where we are. Basically. Next question. All right, Ernst is back. Ernst is asking, what size VM do you typically start with? Uh, it's the do whatever. It's the smallest one with the premium storage. Is it the DS, whatever? It's the it's it's uh, DS V three. DS one V DS one V two or something like that. Um, okay. But it's it's the one that is like I say. If you do pay as you go, it's around a hundred bucks a month, and. Uh, yeah, that's right. Because we're yes, that that is the one that we've been using to date. Yeah, yeah I think it's, it's like sufficient for, for the service. Yeah, uh, you wouldn't use that if you're hosting applications or stuff like that. But you'd have to go higher. For yeah, exactly. But for AD, this is perfectly fine. Yeah. And there's more to it than that. There's also Azure backups. There's VPN. There's other things you have to be cognizant of too. It's not going to just be the VM cost. It's not much more. But you have to be thinking about the other services. Yeah. Good, good point, Michael. Yeah, that well, and that's actually a really good point because you know for the first few years, uh, that was the only conversation we could 
find in the SMB MSP space was Azure Backup. You know what I mean? Just initially, we're all just sitting around going, oh, you know, what is it? Um, but that's an aside. Let's, let's keep moving, guys. Uh, Robert asked, if a customer has a DC in the cloud, what sort of solutions do you have for on-prem file storage, please? Um, so you, you, you want to you take that? Well, there, there's a couple of ways. Uh, I would say the, the, what we found to be the most reliable and what I would suggest uh, as, as, as a, from a Microsoft standpoint, uh, drinking the Kool-Aid, uh, I would say a file <laughs> server integrated with your, with, your, with your, like a full normal file server integrated with AD uh, with, the, with the AD controller on the cloud will work just fine. Uh, now there's solutions out there that are uh, maybe less expensive. Uh, right. NAS, so if we're going, well, hold on a second. Uh, hold on. So if we're going, okay, let, me, let me back up a little bit. So if we're talking about the the, the use case that we that we that we talked about at the beginning of the conversation, where it's a it's a it's a, a client that does not have a server, they're not looking to get a server, but they want Active Directory. Then we've been using we've been we've been using OneDrive, yes. and, and and in the past we've we've used other competing file sync technologies. So you can use OneDrive for individual files. You can use group policy to force the use of OneDrive for essentially using, essentially use group policy to force folder redirection of the user's folders into the OneDrive folder. And then you can also, you can use OneDrive to synchronize SharePoint libraries of files. And that's kind of where we are with our smaller clients. We're not really putting in NAS devices at this point not putting in the NAS devices, not putting in on-prem servers, trying to avoid that additional hardware purchase. That that is a possibility for future stuff. And if that's what you're into, by all means, if that if that works for you, then great. We're actually trying to stay away from that and looking for ways to um, to to more fully utilize what Microsoft offers, both in terms of OneDrive and um, we just like. We're, you know, one of the things we just became aware of is Azure Files, which is basically SMB shares from the cloud, which that's a whole other topic and a bit of an aside, and maybe we can talk about that later, Harry, but those are yeah. those are options, yeah. and then the things that Christian was talking about. Yeah, exactly. I was, I was coming system. from the more traditional, what most of us have grown up with is, okay, you have a file yeah. server on site, even if you don't have AD on site, you can still have a file server or NAS, but yes, I agree with Zaka. The, the industry and where we want to go ourselves and the way Microsoft, uh, the new gospel from Microsoft is indeed moving away from that. And OneDrive, SharePoint, uh, Azure Files, those are all technologies that get you in that direction. All righty, Ben asks, uh, what is the smallest client counting in users that you, you, you've, you're implementing this for? Smallest client size. So at the moment, I think both both of them are six six users. Okay. All right, uh, gentlemen on the panel, do we have permission to share your oh, email? Uh, or, or, kind of okay, go ahead. So so six six on the plain hosted AD. We've got prospects in the twenty range who we're looking at doing that for, and then we have proposals already in that are essentially approved to do that you saw that there was the mike can you back up a slide or two slides three slides um talking about using hosted ad essentially as a backup that one right there that's 200 end users about a hundred of them are using on-prem ad we're going to have about a hundred other that are going to use hosted ad yeah. and that'll probably be a little bit bigger vm but nonetheless it's a, that's an organization where it, it makes sense to do it yeah on the on the other end of the spectrum as smallest uh, to, to take your page from Gary Pika, uh, oh. there is there is no smallest client. There is only clients <laughs> for, you know, for uh, uh, basically a yeah. need that's lined up with what you're offering. That and that is the end of that of of, of that. Well, uh, the, and the nicer thing is, uh, yeah, could offer one if, one user. If they're, if they're willing to pay, yeah, they're willing to pay for it. Then. If that works for them, if that meets their requirements, who yeah. are we to uh, to say no to them? Exactly. So, but that, and that was your point too, Zach, like, you know, build a blueprint. You can have it for your six user environment. You can use it for your 200 user environment. You know, obviously if it makes sense, but that's the whole premise of trying to standardize this entire process and blueprint it. Yes, we're actually trying to stay uh, out. 
<laughs> All right. Okay. Hey, gentlemen, uh, and I, I sent a little note to Jenny, but I just want to verify. Ben and a few others would like your contact information in tomorrow's thank you uh, email from Jenny. Is is that okay for people to follow up directly with you? Yep. All right. Yep. No problem at all. Okay. So all right. Thank you. And then Ben, Ben, boy, Ben, you are chatty. God bless you. Um, ben says, how often are you setting up virtual desktops along with the virtual servers in Azure? Uh, we, we are not yet doing that. We, 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 one of the, one of the things that we typically like to do that we in the past hadn't done. So in the past we would test on our clients and I'm sure that nobody else out there has done that ever. Um, but we would we would uh, use them as our guinea pigs, and um, we're finally at the size where <laughs> that doesn't fly very well, and that uh, we we use ourselves as guinea pigs. So we actually we have a hosted desktop environment that we have in um, it's actually in IBM's cloud right now, and uh, it's on still on server 2008. So that gives you an idea of how long we've had it, and and gee, server 2008 is going end of life. So uh, one of the, the parallels blueprint, that's actually the first, the first customer for that is gonna be ourselves and then our other, our other sister company. So, um, but I, based, on, based on how this has run in other clouds, I, I actually think it's gonna run just fine in Azure. And it'll certainly be a lot easier and a lot faster for us to set up. So All righty. Okay, any, okay. any, oh, or back up. Uh, folks, we have about a minute left to stay on schedule. So the timing actually did work out well. I'm gonna do a last call for questions. Um, I've kind of cleared the deck, a lot of compliments over here on the other screen. Thank you for your compliments and, and appreciate that. Uh, I've taken some side notes. So we're gonna come back fall quarter with a double click um, on this topic and uh, Let's do a last call. I'll give it another 30 seconds. Uh, gentlemen, while we're doing last call, any um, conferences that uh, attendees can expect to see you at uh, with the, the balance of the year? We, we got IT Nation. Any of you go into some of the, Zach, go ahead. Where might people see you and your, your partner? I will definitely be at IT Nation in Orlando in, uh, on Halloween. Oh my gosh, it's on Halloween. Oh, they changed uh, it. Oh man! Wow. Yeah. Last, <laughs> last week, last uh, last part of October into November, and uh, I think that's it. Maybe a ConnectWise user group down in Southern California for those people who are in the uh, SoCal area. I'm not allowed to leave the office. Nope. He, he. What you can't see is the ball and chain that are on Christian's Christian's <laughs> ankle. Currently. There you go. Uh, Michael, uh, quickly, uh, any conferences you're going to between now and the end of the year? Uh, I should also be at IT Nation. Uh, aside from that, I'll probably be at uh, some of the other major cloud shows like AWS reInvent. Um, yep. And then the other two, Microsoft and Google, but next day, both of those events are now uh, the main, main ones next year. I'm going to some other smaller uh, Google and Azure events up here in Seattle. So if anybody's up here in the Seattle area, um, and aside from that, if, I, if I'm gonna go to any more, I'll, I'll update everybody. Um, and I am doing all day DevOps about solution delivery on November 6th as well. Anybody can join and it's free. Um, I'm one of the speakers for that as well. So there should be like 50,000 uh, people attending. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Um, if it's free, I'll take two, let me tell you. Right. Uh, <laughs> gentlemen, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what they don't teach you in college. Um, gentlemen, <laughs> thank you so much uh, helping us uh, basically get our get our game on for summer quarter with the MSP Tech Talk. Folks, again, before you go, if you could click on the chat feature and click through to our heroes contest. So what is a hero? Let me frame it up. The SMB 150 contest ran for three years. I believe it was 2011, 12, and 13. Uh, some of the people on the call were involved in that. And we were looking for people who were either nominated or self-nominate themselves. We're not worried about that who consider themselves thought leaders in our community. In that case, it was uh, strictly the SMB MSP community. 
what we're trying to do here is get people um, excited in the same way to uh, receive community validation and acknowledgement through a voting process, uh, be eligible to win a handful of different prizes. And if you're the first 100 to get the, the latest book on how to be an MSP, you'll get the digital copy. But we're, we're just looking for people who get it, who have a leadership quality to them. And look no further than uh, uh, Michael Frazier's uh, LinkedIn profile, and you'll see that leadership is a function, in my opinion, Michael, and you resemble this, but uh, you've been published, you uh, went to college and beyond, you have work experience, you've been involved in community service and activities, and as, as well as uh, you've won some awards. You won the $100,000 at IT Nation, and that's, we're trying to build that culture, and it will never hurt you. It will never hurt you to be going to trade associations and joining contests and winning awards and so on, um, because uh, just selfishly, I, I throw a lot of that into the category of business development, um, although I do believe in karma dollars. <laughs> yep. I do too. Nice. So with, with that said, folks, have a great day. Jenny in the radio control room. Thanks as always. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.